Hi there, everybody. My name is Richard Franklin. I'm the Director of Instruction at Deer Path Golf Course in Lake Forest, Illinois, and the founder of the Richard Franklin Golf Academy. And I'm coming today from our performance studio inside the clubhouse. I can't think of ever having a student that didn't want to hit the ball a little bit further. So with that in mind, I have decided to tackle the subject I think most pertinent to the delivery of above average club head speed. In my opinion, the players with the most efficient swings and ultimately the most club head speed, I think of players with the best upper body mechanics. So we're going to talk about in detail through the use of data points collected by a piece of technology that I use on a daily basis like the 8 sensor AMM motion capture we're going to talk about commonalities that those players have. Very distinct interactions between their torso, their lead arm, and their wrists. These are traits that the best players in the world have, and I'm going to explain to you today in detail how you can take some of those concepts and apply them into your game. When assessing a new student, the first thing I look at is their golf specific body performance with 3D measurement. Of all the data points that the 3D capture provides me with, a major point of emphasis is the kinematic sequence. Evaluating a player's kinematic sequence allows me to quickly assess whether that player has the ability to use the main driver joints of the body in an appropriate fashion to sequentially transfer energy into the golf ball. An in-depth analysis of the kinematic sequence can garner a massive amount of useful information to any golfer looking to improve. But for the sake of this video, we are going to review the upper body's role in the downswing portion of the sequence. As a quick reference, the hip's rotational velocity, thorax rotational velocity, lead arm angular velocity, and the club's angular velocity are what are being represented and they are being shown by the red, green, blue, and brown lines respectively. This video aims to share with the golfer basic prerequisites for acquiring maximum rotational velocity of the thorax and correspondingly high rates of angular velocity with the lead arm and club. Such prerequisites include specific positional orientations, utilizing stretch shorten cycles and a general sense of mechanical commonalities that the best players in the world all share. This introduction is a look at two graphs of players with that are on the opposite sides of the playing aptitude scale. The swing on the left represents a professional player's kinematic sequence and the graph on the right is that of a struggling weekend player. Pay special attention to the green, blue, and brown curves as they are the various speeds of the recorded upper body segments. Although these graphs do not display positional orientations, I can tell you that the player on the right is severely out of position with his thorax at the top of the swing. He is also demonstrating a considerably less than ideal interaction between his thorax and lead arm early downswing, as well as faulty mechanics with his lead wrist. These topics will be covered in great detail in the following sections. An important discussion point is the reason we determine the kinematic sequence on the left is ideal and the swing on the right is less than ideal. It is due to the difference in joint-by-joint -joint gain ratios. The simple definition of gain in this case is the distal segment's max velocity as compared to its proximal segment. In this case, when primarily looking at the upper body, the proximal segment will be the green thorax line. Distal to this segment is the lead arm blue line and the brown line club. As a, as a golfer seeing this graph for the first time, simply look at the distance between the maximum peaks of each colored line. The gain is a numerical representation of such gaps. Another interesting note for the viewer to address is the curvature of the lines in the pro swing versus the amateur. The lack of dissension late in, in the downswing means that there is no deceleration of the segments. 
This is a clear sign that energy is not efficiently being transferred from body to club. A complete section later in this video is devoted to explaining how to create timely segmental deceleration in the downswing. Let's take for granted that we have reasonable pelvic mechanics that we're getting stretching away from the thorax, that we're getting good separation, and therefore the thorax has already the best potential to move quickly uh, in a rotational sense in the beginning of the downswing. So we take that for granted. There's a couple other things we need to discuss to ensure those ideal rotational velocities in the thorax. The first being positional orientations. It is very important for us all to understand that the thorax needs to be positioned in a very certain way to give it um, its, its best mechanical advantage to rotate. So let me discuss three concepts with you about how this torso functions. We need very particular side bend values, forward bend values, and rotation values. So let's start with how we address the golf ball. So when we address the golf ball, we are going to be typically about 35 to 40 degrees forward bent. Now, at the top of our swing, we are actually zero degrees bent in an ideal situation. So what we're doing is we're taking the forward bend at address and we're substituting it for left side bend incrementally as we make a backswing. So the two dysfunctions you can have in your torso in the backswing are improper side bend profilings and improper loss of forward bend. So to give everybody a drill at home of how I want you to construct your backswing, here's how you start. You can just stand up tall. You're going to have your left arm, if you're a right-handed golfer, right if you're a left-handed golfer. You're going to put it on the edge of your thigh here. All I want you to do is side bend your torso till, about you, till you get to about the top of your left knee. That's about 35 degrees of left side bend. Now, I'd like you to stay in that orientation. You can kind of keep your hand above your kneecap, and I want you to rotate. Now, in this part of the swing, you know you've got the right amount of left side bend. Now to, now, to make sure that you don't go into what we call negative spine angle or back bend, I want you to feel like your torso is slightly pointing to the right, like so. So this would be kind of straight up and down. This would be pointing towards the target. So if you can do these in tandem, Get the left side bend, fingertip just to the edge of the kneecap, rotate, stay in that left side bend, and then feel like you're slightly leaned to the right hand side. You're going to be in the best possible position to rotate that thorax aggressively. Let's first start with the acceleration profile of the lead arm relative to the trunk. This is a crucial, crucial area in how a golfer gives themselves the best chance to express energy from their upper body. So when we make a backswing, our left arm, I think this profile would probably be the best way to look at it. If I created here just a 90 degree angle between my left arm and my thorax, when I make a backswing, that left arm is going to be somewhat across my body. So that would be more of a 45 degree orientation. Now, because we've understood how to get in a good position, we're going to fire our thorax first. You can see that as I fire the thorax into the lead arm, that's going to make this angle smaller. Let's take a quick moment to reference a couple 3D graphs to show you how this lead arm to trunk relationship is displayed in graphical format 
and how that relationship plays out throughout the swing and ultimately affects the kinematic sequence. On the top left hand side of the screen you will see this lead shoulder angle. So this 57.3 is sitting at address. This particular golfer has their left arm 33 degrees away from 90 if it were just laying completely straight on the left hand side of the thorax. So as this golfer is making a swing, that left arm in about this phase will start to go more across the chest and that is displayed here by this 57 number starting to diminish. So from the 57, if I scroll to the top, you can see that that golfer has a 45 degree angle. So that left arm has gone across the chest approximately 12 degrees. So what we want to do here is reference how the interplay between the left arm and the trunk as shown here in this graph, how that signifies whether the golfer is utilizing a stretch shorten cycle and then ultimately how this relationship plays into the acquired rotational and angular velocities as shown in the kinematic sequence. So what you will notice here is that as the golfer transitions from top of swing when the club has reached its end range, as this golfer as seen here in the kinematic sequence is starting to move strongly in a rotational aspect with the thorax relative to the trunk at a greater clip than the trunk you will see this angle as I slowly play through the swing. Notice on the left hand side here this angle sharply diminishing. So the orientation of that lead arm across the trunk is going from about 46 degrees to 42.943. The total range of motion in that in the lead shoulder musculature is not great, but utilizing those couple degrees of stretch is crucial. What you'll notice is that stretch has given this player the best chance of creating some strong acceleration profiling in this lead arm. He is experiencing a tremendous gain now between the max rotational velocity of his trunk as represented by the green curve and the max angular velocity of his lead arm as represented by the blue curve. And like we just discussed, it's ultimately the contraction or the shortening between your trunk and your lead arm that's going to give the lead arm its greatest chance to accelerate. So if we can stretch or shorten this angle initially when we fire that left arm the firing is going to be that much stronger putting the brakes on the thorax extremely important concept to understand so again as a take home I think pretty much everybody across the board would do themselves well to think about this angle between their left arm and their chest and think about as a drill when you make a downswing turn in, turn in to that lead arm. Feel like as the middle of your thorax starts to un unwind itself into the target that that arm gets closer to your chest. Let's first look at what the thorax does when it's accelerating the fastest and then what the best players in the world do to counteract that. So we discussed in the previous section that the thorax, when it makes a backswing, it left side bends, it basically comes out of its forward orientation, and it puts itself here. So you're going to see values in, a, in an ideal situation of zero forward bend to you know five or eight degrees forward bent at the top and about 35 degrees left side bent. The first motion that you're going to see is you're going to see some forward motion with the thorax. That's positive sway. You're going to see the golfer reclaiming its, his or her forward bend. 
and then you're going to see some of that left side bend get taken out. So while it's rotating, it's fastest in the downswing. Again, it is the golfer is reclaiming its forward bend and going forward. So to counteract those movements, we need the thorax when it's ready to break, and it's going to break right about in here, it needs to stop putting forward bend back in. It's going to be actually taking forward bend out. It's going to be taking forward bend out. So what you would see is a thrust, thrust being this, forward and back, you would actually start seeing a negative thrust value. So you can see from that angle, if I put my bend back in, as I start to take this bend out, I start to right side bend. You can see the middle of my thorax is going to start thrusting back. In previous episodes, we've talked about the concept of going normal. That going normal at the ball is feeling like you're going away from the hit, that all the energy is going into you. That is an overarching concept would be a great way to think about neutralizing, so to speak, this forward, forward and bending back down, going away. So again, take those forward bend and forward components and feel like you go away and back from the golf ball and you've got the very best chance at offsetting some of those accelerations. Let's reference the kinematic sequence that we referred to at the beginning of the show. On the top left hand side is the professional kinematic sequence, the bottom left the amateur sequence. Immediately to the right of each graph is their corresponding lead wrist angles. What we want to notice on the kinematic sequence is the gain or the gap between the top of the respective blue curves and the top of the brown curves. Those those, the space between those curves represent the gain or the difference in angular velocity between the lead arm and club. The, gator, the greater the gain, the, the better the performance in the wrists because that, that shows that the player is able to transfer energy from the lead arm through the wrist out to the club. So let's explore that in a little bit more detail looking at each player's specific lead wrist angles. On the right hand side I want us to refer to the red, green, and blue curves. The red is the vertical hinging of the wrists. The blue is the rolling of the wrist and the green is the flexing or extending or bowing or cupping of the wrist. When each one of those curves goes down it is showing the wrist vertically hinging, the wrist rolling, palm down, or the lead wrist cupping. So the inverse is true. When it goes up, it is flexing or bowing. When it goes up, it is going palm up or supinating. In the case of the red, it would be vertically unhinging. So let's have a quick look at what the professional player is doing that's helping them pick up a gain of more than 1300 degrees per second. As a quick reference, the amateur player with the same club driver is, is experiencing less than a thousand degrees per second a gain. So quickly referring to the professional lead wrist angle. Let's take a look first at what the vertical hinge component of his wrist is doing. It's basically staying at the same rate until very late into the downswing and then it rapidly fires or unhinges or cocks vertically down. The lead wrist is experiencing roll in a palm down fashion or a pronation fashion. At the same time that this blue curve is going down late in the downswing, the green is going up. So that means he's flexing or bowing his lead wrist and rotating his wrist to the right. Now. As a quick comparison, let's look at, take a look at the amateur player. His vertical hinge is almost immediately dissipating 
early downswing. So you can see the difference here. The, the red curve and the professional staying very constant until late. The amateur player dissipating very quickly. Stark differences here in the blue curve. Immediately that lead wrist is beginning to go palm up or pronating. Different pattern in the green line as well. So this player doesn't go into any kind of extension in the backswing. He just stays flexed the whole time. So with this in mind, what the professional player is doing, and, and, and as a note to that, all players or the majority of players that show very good lead arm to club gain have a very similar pattern to the one being demonstrated here. So let's, let's refer now to some drills that you at home can use to install some of these professional wrist alignments in your swing. When we make a backswing, if you increase pronation of the lead arm, you're going to see that the relative inclination of the butt end of the shaft is going to change. So a good idea for you at home is you can take a target line, have, kind of, have some kind of straight edge on the ground. You're going to notice in reference to that point where the handle is pointing to. Work on making this transition where you feel this forearm rotate clockwise and now the butt end of the shaft is pointing a little bit outside of that line. Then in tandem with that start to feel this lead wrist call it kind of a reverse J here. Reverse J you need to feel what that is like as you lower the shaft by rotating your form. So again you're gonna make a backswing rotate your forearm, start to make that reverse J or bow your lead wrist. That's going to put you in a position to make a powerful loaded strike into the goal. So, by having some flexion built in to our downswing, we can now have the club delofted. We can start to have this left wrist go into extension rapidly, we will have still conserved or taken off enough loft into the strike that even though we're giving it up, we're still going to have enough dynamic loft. It's going to be low enough at impact because we put enough in to start with. So again, by flexing this lead wrist, you're going to have de-lofted the club and then by having enough de-lofted early, you can take it out which also, again, by this distal to proximal relationship, it's going to naturally decelerate the lead arm. If you have throwing here early, what you're going to typically see players have is this lead arm continue to accelerate. You want ultimately the feeling that if there was like a wall here, that left arm slams into the wall that back of that left hand cups and like we've said in previous shows this hand on the wall finish is never a bad idea so as you go through if you've properly loaded this wrist in a flexion plane you can extend and go hand on the wall I have probably never seen such increased gains in club head speed by players changing flexion extension pattern I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. I had a lot of fun presenting this material. I think it's extremely important. I think that ultimately the player that can gain control and understanding of their most sensitive instruments, their hands, their arms, those things closest to the golf club, if they can fully appreciate how to change for the better the mechanics that are as close to those sensitive instruments as possible, your upper body, you're going to make the fastest gains, the most sustainable gains, and really change your golf swing. So I encourage everybody at home to start with positional requirements, understand the connection between the torso and the lead arm, apply some of those wrist concepts, and it will not be long before you start playing some of the best golf of your life. Thank you so much.